Empire. The gears of the sports world have gradually started to crank again. Not fully, but it's cranking nonetheless. What does it mean for the NFL? What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Football Jones Podcast. This is Mike Jones. You can read me at usatoday.com. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Jones. Back after a week off, later on today's episode, I'm going to talk to Liz Clark of the Washington Post because although, no, football is not back, baseball, basketball is not back yet, but NASCAR returned on Sunday. And you ask, well, this is a football podcast, but what does it have to do with football? Well, NASCAR is similar to the NFL because the bulk of its revenue is drawn from TV contracts. And that's why they really wanted to get cranking again. And there were a lot of restrictions. It was not the norm, but NASCAR is determined to get going. They had their first race. We're going to talk to Liz about how that played out. And then we'll do some kind of connecting dots and speculating on what it means for the NFL and what we can expect. That's the bulk of today's episode. First, just want to talk about one matter because a couple weeks ago, As you remember, we had Jim Trotter on and we talked about a lot of things, but one of them being the problem with diversity in the NFL, specifically in the front offices. And Jim just last week reported that the NFL's diversity committee um, and some of the owners are a part of that are going to be voting as they have their meetings this week on a number of matters. But one of them would be a resolution that would award an incentive to teams that hire minority head coaches and general managers. They would be given improved draft pick status. You know, if a team hires a minority head coach, they would jump up six spots from where they were slotted, and a team would jump up 10 spots under the same scenario if they hired a person of color as their primary football executive. And since we were talking about that, I just I wanted to comment on this and I've heard from a lot of people last week um, you know I had a number of people around the league hit me up saying hey what do you think of this this resolution that the owners are are expected to vote on um, on Tuesday and a lot of people are taking note look I think it's great the NFL's leadership is trying to take and, and tackle this problem head on um, they're, they're trying to find a way to change the mindsets of owners, hoping that they'll realize that um, a league with healthy diversity is a better league. But I didn't talk to anybody who felt like this is something that has a real strong chance of passing because the owners don't want to be told who to hire. That's been clear. Um, they have overlooked highly qualified candidates that are minorities for years and they're not going to start just all of a sudden because they're awarded um, draft picks. But at the same time, it's also a a number of of talent evaluators, not general managers, but guys who aspire to be GMs told me that they find the the proposal a little insulting because they don't want to be hired because their team is basically being bribed. They felt like well, now uh, teams will be being paid to hire us. They want to be hired on their their ability, hired on merit, not because of the color of their skin. They don't want to be a token hire, um, and they don't want someone to look at them and say, oh, well, the only reason why he got his job was because... No, they want consideration. And look, again, it is great. The NFL Diversity Committee is trying anything they possibly can um, to to try to open the minds of owners and decision makers into realizing that uh, they need more opportunities of advancement for people of color. But I don't think that this is the way. Guys want a seat at the table. They want opportunities. But because a team is dangling a draft pick, you know, and awarded an improved st- status um, and incentive to hire them, 
uh, that's not the way. Um, we'll see what happens. I'd be shocked if this thing is passed, but just wanted to touch on that because I've heard from so many people around the league who feel like, look, yes, great thought, but also opens a whole nother can of worms. And uh, we'll, we'll continue working towards um, equal opportunity, but yeah, this probably isn't the way to go. Anyway, when we come back, going to talk to Liz Clark about NASCAR's return, the questions that the decision makers had to answer, the, the safety measures that they put in place, what it means for that sport going forward, and what it means for the sports world as a whole, the NFL and beyond, when the Football Jones podcast returns. And here we are with my very good friend, Liz Clark, my former Washington Redskins beatmate uh, from the Washington Post. Uh, we were in the foxhole together for several seasons. And Liz, I'm really happy to have you here on the Football Jones podcast. Thanks for coming on today. I'm so honored, Mike. Um, it's just a joy to see you again. And I'm your biggest fan and I miss being your teammate. So. I miss being with you as well. <laughs> Um, you know, I wanted to have you on because this big question of when sports will return really just continues to hang and it will continue to hang over all of us for some time. Uh, but um, if you all don't know, Liz is very versatile. She has covered just about everything there is to cover um, in the sports world. Um, and she uh, is very, very much an authority on NASCAR. And so she had a really fascinating story over the weekend on NASCAR's return. If you didn't know, NASCAR came back on Sunday. There were no fans. There were a lot of restrictions and things like that mm -hmm. um, that Liz is going to talk about. But I wanted to have Liz come on because as NASCAR comes back, there are other pro sports leagues are watching and trying to learn and see how things play out for them. Um, and so I wanted to talk about, to Liz about how NASCAR did it, what they learned, and um, what she thinks we can all expect going forward. So Liz, what was the, the most interesting aspect as you were doing your reporting on just how the officials pulled this all together and why they felt like now was a good time um, to bring back the, the races? I was, you know, initially skeptical that they would both solicit and listen to expert medical advice. So, so my main takeaway is the seriousness with which NASCAR went about figuring out if we do this, when, how, where do we do this, and what are the proper restrictions to, you know, to make this happen? They, they took it very, very seriously. So they consulted with an infectious disease specialist, with government officials at both the federal, state, and local level, and public health officials. And I think they went through 35 or 40 iterations of different scenarios. They start each year with a 36 race schedule. They miss 10 because of the virus shutdown, and they have always maintained they're gonna get in all 36. So when they started, they needed, when they start back, they need to both add a bunch of races in or do, you know, the schedule will be compressed for a while. So I, I think the first thing they did pretty smartly is figuring out, just thinking in terms of a first couple weeks back and just look at that first couple weeks. The simplest way to start with the safety is have all the races within driving distance. You know, keep all the tracks close so that nobody needs to get on a plane and nobody needs to stay in a hotel. They shorten the schedule so there's no staying in hotels. So then it's a matter of keeping everybody who participates at the track with the proper distance and, and safe coming in and safe going out. They limited the, the entourage, if, if, if you will, of each of the 40 teams. You could bring 40 people if you wanted, you know, including PR staffs and all this other extraneous stuff. They were held to 16 people, including the driver, crew chief. That's pretty lean for a NASCAR. Yeah. So you could only bring that many. Every person, I want to say for five days or maybe a week in advance, had to keep a log of where they were, who they interacted with in case at some later date they test positive and you want to do the contact tracing. They could say, here are my contacts. So they had to keep that paperwork. Then arriving at the track race morning, each person 
stayed in their car, including the drivers, mask on, and had to have a, a health screening, which included that temperature check, like at your forehead, by a similarly masked health official. So you 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 go in with no fever. The drivers had to go straight to the motor homes that were there for them, each one, and stay in it. You know, there was no fraternizing at all, which is really normal on a race morning. You know, social distancing was enforced. As you said, not only no fans allowed, only four reporters were credentialed. First, they were going to do none, and they got quite a pushback. So they allowed four reporters to be on hand, but they were in the press box overlooking. They could not have any face-to-face -face interaction with the drivers. Real quick, since we're reporters, that, you know, when I read that, my ears yeah. really, like, perked up. Because, yeah. Um, how do they pick four? Um, well, they did it. You know, that's a great question. They did it, I thought, in a very intelligent way. Because, um, of course, my backdop is like, I need to go, you know, we all need to go. How do you, so they, they started with AP, Associated okay. Press, which is, basically serves everyone. Mm -hmm. um, then they added a local reporter, you know, someone from the Darlington, South Carolina era, area, as they should. And then there's such a thing as called the Motorsports Press Association, like the NFL Writers Association, right? Right. And they right. said, you guys have two selections. You you choose two, which I which I thought was very fair. I, I don't, I'm not even sure who they chose. So that was the four. And I think there was a bit of a tussle over photography, and they allowed one photographer. And then Fox Broadcast, which carried the race, they also were cut to the bone um, for safety's sake. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that was here's what NASCAR will allow. And Fox is very protective of its own people. So Fox always has four pit reporters, one for each turn. They only were allowed one. They had a very skeletal camera crew. They had, I think, a producer and a truck on site. But the, the on-camera guys calling the race were in Charlotte. They, they weren't even at the track, you know, but they were kitted out with these big screens. There was thought and care in every aspect of the thing that fell into like different buckets of, limit the number of people exposed, you know, on hand, and then do everything you can to make sure they stay within their own space, right, and right. then have a means to go back and figure out what went wrong if somebody comes down with the fever. Now, the, the other thing was, okay, you make a lot of money off of fans, ticket sales, and things like that, but obviously not that much because as you explained in your story, the bulk of the revenue for NASCAR comes from those TV contracts. And that's the same thing for the NFL. And so yeah. um, they felt like it was worth it to, to honor those TV contracts and at least take in that revenue, knowing that, okay, yes, we're gonna lose some off of ticket sales, but we're gonna make the bulk of our money off of these TV deals, correct? Absolutely. And I think, I mean, it's not something in the forefront of sports fans' minds, but they're, kind of two categories of sports in terms of the revenue pot. Some that get the bulk of their money from TV deals. The NFL is the leader in this. It is a massive amount of money and all 30 team, 32 teams share equally in that TV money. And, and NASCAR used to be mainly gate receipts reliant, but now they're more TV contract reliant. So you, you, you've taken this money already. You've contracted, we're gonna deliver X number of games so you really want to honor that contract, plus you want to keep your sport in the public eye. So I think we'll see going forward, no matter what the sport is, those that really rely on TV revenue, there's a big incentive for those to get back on the air. If you get your money from gate receipts and it's kind of a given that you can't have fans, well, what are you accomplishing by staging a race or an event with no fans? You know, you don't, you don't get a real gain. So in that way, uh, the, the, the incentive to get back on TV, get back going, is, is, is similar NFL to NASCAR. Right. How did it play out and what was the reaction from the drivers? Um, not having fans there. I know when they're in their cars and they're racing, they don't hear the fans. Um, you know, there's not like there's any way to react um, and interact with them. But when you win a race, Normally, you're jumping out and there's cheers. And, and um, what was that like, um, that atmosphere, from what you were able to gather, um, yes. being silent like that? You know, that to me, as I wake up today and I process the race, and um, that has been the, the game change that is really weighing on me and, and kind of was, 
I like to pride myself on anticipating storylines and kind of knowing what's at stake and what's going to happen. Uh, the game changing whammy of having this event in front of empty grandstands, I really didn't understand how profound that was going to be. Um, and, and I was not one of the four journalists. I was watching on TV. So to, to answer more coherently, in the reporting I was able to do by phone and teleconference and Zoom calls before, the drivers were like, we don't have time to look in the stands. It's not going to bother us once we're in the car. As you say, we're racing uh, white knuckle focus. We're, we're not aware. Um, so no biggie. Uh, although we wish the fans could join us. You know, they, they pay respect to the fans, but it's like, it's not going to throw me off my game. It won't change the event. Kevin Harvick is the winner. He's the, it's not like his first win. This is his 50th. He's, right. he's like had tons of chances to celebrate. So he does the classic, pull the car um, right up on the front stretch, right in the center of where the, the start finish line is, you know, does the guy thing, you know, so, you know, burns out the tires, does the donuts, smoke is spewing. It's just classic. It's, it's like the, the automotive expression of joy. So the car is celebrating and then always the driver pops out and then he's celebrating. So he does all that. He pops out and like looks at the stands and it's, it's like beyond, it's not even that there are no fans. It's actually depressing, to, at least to me, because it just underscores, oh my God, our world is, is not the same. And it's like, there's no one here unless there might be a rat like scurrying along. I mean, not that there was a rat, but you just, it's like that post-apocalyptic, yeah. this is not normal. And he even said like, bless his heart, you know, for the candor, the, for the microphone, I don't know to what extent you can see me, but like the microphone like enters the screen, you know, it's on this pole because the reporter is standing so far back to interview him and capture this moment of joy. And Kevin Harvick is like, I'm paraphrasing, you know, this really is different. You know, there's, yeah. I just won the race. I'm celebrating and there's no one here. You know, boy, we miss the fans. And so it's the game changer. You know, I've been thinking about this a lot is that even though we all watch televised sports to see the sport, I don't think we acknowledge just subliminally how much a part of the emotion, the rise and fall, the momentum, the change is the fact that the fans are part of it. You know, if you're watching Duke basketball, the Cameron crazies are part of the narrative. If you're watching Michigan football, that's part of it. If you're watching even the worst NFL team, the fans with the bags over their heads, that's part of it. Like that's kind of how you know where the momentum is. And particularly if it's a sellout, that's how as a, as a fan on your couch, you wish you were there because it's like, oh my God, this is a tough ticket to get. I want to be there. I can't be there. This is like anybody cool is there, but I'm not, but I'm going to make the best of it. I'm watching on TV. And this is just like this desolate landscape. It's very eerie, very eerie. So are there, are there plans to gradually introduce fans or what are they mm -hmm. waiting for? Mm -hmm. What has to happen before they'll let a sparsely filled um, NASCAR arena um, take place? Yes. I mean, no doubt they've been thinking about this, plotting this, researching this. I don't know where they are in that process. I mean, what we do know is that sadly, in our country, it varies state by state, you know, whether public gatherings are allowed at all, public gatherings of more than 150 people, more than 10 people, no people at all, unless you're doing an essential errand. So it, we're kind of balkanized there. Um, for the short term, happily, NASCAR, in racing close to home, home being Charlotte, they're in a lot of states that have flung open their doors for business, South Carolina mm -hmm. being one of them. Like, hello, bring it on, come to the beaches and come, you know, although obviously they didn't have fans. So um, as it relates to fans, so you're gonna have to, first of all, obey local rules. Um, you're gonna have to have a sense that fans themselves are comfortable being in these crowded settings. As much as fans miss sports, I still don't know that a lot of families are gonna to wanna to take their kids like they used to and jam in a grandstand. So, so there's that. So a lot has to happen. And, and I think a lot of sports are trying to figure out both the practical issue and the economic issue of 
okay, what if we sell every fifth seat? And certainly the airlines are thinking about this. What if we sell uh, only aisle seats or you know, take out enough seats that you can maintain proper distancing? What does that do to the mass? Is that mm -hmm. worth it? So I think that's part of the calculus there. Do you require masks to have fans? I mean, I was <laughs> fans to have masks. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it'll be, what Matt NASCAR is saying publicly is for the foreseeable future, no fans. And I think that's it, honest and as far as they can go. Right, right. Um, and I guess the, the benefit of NASCAR, as you said, a lot of those guys, their headquarters are down there in, in yeah. Charlotte. Um, the NFL has the restrictions of they're in different states. And while maybe the doors might open, you know, the, the, the Falcons facility in Georgia can open, the, the, Ray, the Rams and the Chargers in California or the, you know, the Giants and the Jets up in New Jersey yeah. um, cannot. Um, and so you're, we're not going to be able to have a real NFL until all 32 teams um, are permitted to open their doors, whereas NASCAR, everybody's kind of in that, lo that location. So I guess it makes sense that that would have been our first pro sport um, to actually return. Um, I just, I don't know um, when, and do you think we ever will this year get back to even a full NASCAR stadium um, or, or even a, a, a partial, yeah. like you said, every fifth? Um, what, are, what are people saying and, and thinking? Yes. Um, well, to go back to the NFL and the good point you're making, you're absolutely right in that the NFL can't piecemeal let certain teams start training camp and doing this. Or I, I, I just like think if they did, because one thing the NFL has always gotten right is that competitive balance. Right. You have to have, that's why the last team picks first in the draft. You have all your rules have to go toward making teams as equal as possible so that everybody has a chance to win, at least from the fans' point of view. You know what I mean? So you can't, you can't have different rules for different teams. So that's a tough bar to reach as it relates to, to, to the NFL's return. But I think you're quite right. Um, what happens in California has to be the same as New York and, and, and their other markets. And yes, another thing that made NASCAR, in addition to at least, they can come up with a seven race mini return, you know, first phase of a return that is geographically compact. You know, we can get that far. Let's see how that goes and then we'll figure out the rest. So that is also good. Another inherent advantage NASCAR has that's kind of obvious is that with or without masks, the drivers are pretty much hermetically sealed already. You know, they have helmets, they, they're in their separate cars and they um, have these suits. I mean, that's, quite different than an MMA in your face, although that is one sport that has come back. True, you know, that's true, another true. kettle of fish. Um, but it's not a sport where you're sitting, sweating, you know, dripping on one another. You know, and that's just, or, or bleeding on one another. That's right. just, that's contact sports. No, that's part of it. So NASCAR doesn't have to worry about that. I am very skeptical. I cannot fathom any U.S. sport played typically in an arena of 18,000 or more. So I'm talking about basketball arenas, football arenas, NASCAR tracks, college football tracks. Opening at full capacity this year, it, it's just unfathomable to me. Um, but I think because of the economic imperative, you're gonna see sports make their best crack at toe in the water, you know, half steps and see how that goes. I think what's harder to calculate and anticipate is that going to be fun, you know, really. I mean, you know, if you have a bunch of bean counters and strategists, and, and I say this with great honor, scientists, medical people, making your plan and keeping it sound and all that is super important. Um, is it really going to be fun to, to pay what you pay and go through what you have to go through to go to a sporting event and have have your little family unit set apart from the next one. I, I don't know, like how is that gonna change the vibe of an entire grandstand jumping to its feet and cheering? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and I think we overlook that the heartbeat of sports is a lot bad. And that is why really wonky um, mathematicians can sit 
and come up with figures that say a home game at Foxborough in in December is worth X points. Right. And right. you know, a home game at Cameron Indoor Stadium is worth X points. And that goes into the points spread. I mean, there is a direct connection between home field slash emotion, passion, athletes momentum and it, it, it it's it's quantifiable it exists so what does sports look like when you strip that out of it? it it's hard to imagine and um you know i know that as far as i mean we have training camps that would be coming up at the the end of july um we don't know what that's going to look like um you know they have football games i just i when i think about this the 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 defense getting out there on third down and the crowd making all the noise trying to make it difficult for yeah. the, the oh, yeah. quarterback and everything yeah. that atmosphere not being there um, a, a sack and a guy's jumping up and get you know motioning to the fans or you're scoring a touchdown and you're jumping into the Lambo leap and everything not having that there um, sports is just so much a part of the fans and I know I mean I guess these guys would rather play than not play. Um, for sure. But still, it's just such a strange world. Um, and I can't imagine. Yeah. Um, now, yeah. are you following any other sports and their return? I know you've been kind of, you you were off sports for a while doing some news related things, I believe. Um, and now you have the NASCAR. What other sports are you following in your reporting um, and the dilemmas yeah. that they're juggling? Yeah. So the one probably that, that jumps first to mind is tennis. Right. So I do know a good bit about their challenges and what ways they're different from all the issues we've discussed. And they, they face a lot, a lot more uh, difficult issues in determining their return for a couple reasons. A, the pro men's and women's tours are global. They race in China, yeah. I mean, all over Asia, all over Europe, South America, the US. So when they resume their schedule, it's not like they can confine it to, okay, we'll do everything in Orlando, much less we're going to do everything in, um, you know, in France. Uh, it's just like you have to green light the whole world because it's a global field. It's a, it's a major long flight for everyone mm -hmm. to, to get there. So your athletes are going to have to be comfortable getting on international flights. You have to get approval from, from every country. And they have a different revenue picture. The, the paying fans, the spectators, are a big part of their revenue, okay. along with the kind of sponsors, not just like a title sponsor, but the sponsors of tennis that pay to be on the scene, to have booths that, that fans can go to and see their products to interact with. You know, the TV money from tennis is not the driver of the revenue. And the, the individual stars have a good bit of clout. I mean, if Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic are like, uh -uh, I, I'm not down with getting on this flight to come to the US Open, as I wish it were in every sport, they'd command some attention. You know, they'd be a factor. They'd be a factor. So um, they're not close. Now, the tennis has four majors. The first one was held before the virus impact became clear. Australian Open was done. Um, the French Open, which was up next in May, announced they're gonna have their French Open in late September. Okay. I'm still not sure that's possible, but for now it's in late September. Wimbledon had to cancel. They just flat out said no Wimbledon this year because you can't postpone a grass course, grass tournament. You know, the, the count, the window has to be right for the weather. So that's all. So anyway, there's the U.S. Open left, which is supposed to start late August in New York, the epicenter of the virus, at the facility that for this time has been converted to a temporary hospital, um, you know, although it, it's coming off that as the incidence goes down in New York. The U.S. Open has not pulled the plug on their tournament. They haven't said we're going to delay it. There's been some talk about could you have a U.S. Open in California in November um, at a different venue. So I, it's, it's unfathomable to me that you let 800,000 people in a stadium, which is the total number over two weeks of a day and night session at the U.S. Open, 800,000 New Yorkers in one place in a couple months. I, I just can't see that. But 
they say mm -hmm. they're still on. And and again, there's less incentive for tennis to have an event with no fans, right. like right. NASCAR is doing, less financial. So so I think they're farther behind, um, which is a pity because it's a beautiful sport. Right. Oh, and of course, you, you would have been covering the Olympics this year, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot yeah. that. Oh, yeah. There is that. That's <laughs> quite, quite the yeah. headline. So as I know your listeners know, the 2020 Olympics are going to be same time next year, the 2021 Olympics, still in Tokyo. There are medical experts who are openly doubting that that is safe, that that's going to work, even with a year's delay. Because again, the Olympics, 10,000 media, I think 8,000 athletes, I am not sure, but it's, it's just close quarters contact. And I, it's not like this is a unique insight to me, um, but it's clear that there needs to be a vaccine, right. a, a credible, readily available global vaccine before you can have an Olympics like normal. So is that possible in 15 months? Some people say yes, some people say no, but I don't see how you have an Olympics without a vaccine. And that's really the standard where people will breathe easily, but that seems on the distant horizon. Right, right. At least we have some more time for that. The NFL, uh, the NBA, all of the sports, you know, they'll be watching as this thing unfolds. Um, and obviously we hope that we can get everything back sooner than later, but it's so hard to to say. Um, but I know I'm definitely going to be watching, you know, each time. When's the next NASCAR race? Well, oddly, it's it's Wednesday. Right. So it's, it's, it's crammed. They're trying to cram as exactly. many as 11 days or something like that. Exactly. They're doing... Uh, I've already lost my numbers, but yeah, to, to make up for the schedule, to get their 36 races in, mm -hmm. they are inventing some new races sure. that actually plays to, to an agenda they already had, which is, would there be an audience for a midweek race? Because the genius of that is you don't have to compete with the NFL in the fall. Yeah. Nobody wants to do that. So they've kind of been wanting to experiment with this. So now, whoa, there is a, a, another race at Darlington, same venue. So again, all the drivers drove there that day, yesterday. They drove home, slept in their homes. So Wednesday morning, they'll drive back to Darlington and race again a shorter distance, which is another kind of secret agenda NASCAR has. has. Can they shorten the races? Which is, I think, a good thing, but it's a tricky thing. Right. Tell, it's like the NFL saying, now we're going to give you games that are just three quarters. Like, right. well, <laughs> you know, yeah. fans are not going to like that. But it would be a better product right. in a shorter race. So they're going to have shorter races. They're going to race Wednesday. Then they're going to have their annual mind-numbing, unbelievable Coca-Cola 600 that in a good year lasts like four and a half hours. Yeah. So they're going to have that on Sunday in Charlotte. Okay. And who knows? They might rope in some new NASCAR fans because there's nothing else to really watch. Um, there, there is that hope. They're yeah. pretty <laughs> blunt about that. It's yeah. like, we're going to be the only thing you to tune into. Right. Um, there is audio, I think, now in, in UFC in some places. Well, Liz, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate the insight. Um, and hopefully sooner than later, we've been talking about getting lunch um, for forever and have never been able to get our schedules. And now we have this, so it'll be forever again. Um, but hopefully sooner than later, I'll, I'll see you in person. Um, tell everybody where they can find you, though. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so bad at that. Um, I, I have a Twitter account, and it's Liz Clark with an E, Twitter. Liz Clark. No, tweet. Sorry. It's not very clever. Liz Clark tweet. Okay. And as wow. long as you don't forget the E. Uh, and then I, I have stories in the Washington Post online. There we go. Thank you, Mike. All right. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, oh. I hope you uh, stay safe. Best to you. Best to your family. And um, I will talk to you soon. I hope so. I hope so. Take care, Mike. All right. Thanks. All right. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed that episode. Um, you know, there are a lot of questions. I don't know when normalcy will return. It's encouraging to see steps being taken and, you know, a number of NFL, um, you know, teams would open their doors uh, because of, of 
you know the localities the restrictions being changed being able to change they don't have players and coaches back yet but steps are being taken but we still just don't know when the full-on operations will resume um, whether it's later this summer whether it's by training camp or, or even later we'll continue to watch we'll continue to um, you know monitor this as everyone is hope you guys have a great day Again, you can read me at usatoday.com. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at by Mike Jones. Please take this link, share it with your friends. Go on there on iTunes. Give me a review and a rating if you feel generous. And uh, hope you guys have a great day. I'll talk to you next week.